Okay. So today we're going to talk about heart failure. We have been talking about several different uh, drug categories that deal with the heart. We started with adrenergics, we did antihypertensives, antianginals, and now we're over here into heart failure. So there are several drugs that are in this category, but are also in this category. We're going to talk about them all the same, but it's just going to be one of those like, hey, this can be a drug for heart failure, or it can also be a drug for uh, antihypertension, just so you know. So these are the drugs that we're going to cover today. The categories include adrenergic agonists, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, B naturetics, can't say that, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and cardiac glycosides. So we're going to get started. The first drugs that we're going to talk about are the adrenergic agonists. These are epinephrine, epinephrine and dopamine. They are catecholamines. And of course, they are for heart failure. The way that they're going to work is they are vasoactive symptoms sympathomimetics, which means they're going to mimic the sympathetic nervous system. They are rapid and potent, and they support the vascular system. So epinephrine and dopamine, rapid and potent, and they support the vascular system. There are a few nursing implications or that uh, the effects of these drugs are going to stop when the medicine stops, and they are available IV only. So that's the first, sec first category that we're talking about. The next are going to be ACE inhibitors, and we've already talked about these back in antihypertensives. ACE inhibitors are the drugs that end in pril. Let me see if you can see that. Can you see that? P-R-I-L. This is lisinopril. The brand name is Prinavil. I think that's how you say that. This drug, of course, is for heart failure, and it works by several different things. It inhibits an angiotensin converting enzyme, which converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is formed through the action of renin, and it prevents sodium and water reabsorption by inhibiting aldosterone secretion. So that's gonna result in diuresis or increased urine production. This diuresis, which is the because of the inhibited, inhibited aldosterone secretion, is going to decrease blood volume, decrease blood return to the heart, decrease preload of the heart, so that the left ventricular end which helps with the left ventricular and di diastolic volume and helps decrease the work of the heart. So diuresis, when you're when the patient is urinating, that's helping to get rid of like excess fluid in the body. So there are a few adverse effects for this drug, including hyperkalemia and dry cough. We already talked about this back in the antihypertensive section about how patients who are on ACE inhibitors can can get angioedema. They can also have a dry, non-productive cough along with hyperkalemia. So of course, we did talk about how ACE inhibitors, you need to monitor your patient's potassium levels. If they're already hyperkalemic, you don't wanna give them a drug that's gonna possibly make them even more hyperkalemic. So that's kind of a nursing implication that you need to know that you need to monitor your patient's potassium levels. If they start having any swelling of the face, which could lead to angioedema, you want to stop that medicine and like tell them to call their doctor immediately. Um, for this drug, there are a few other nursing implications. I'm not going to say this correctly, but they should not take it with the spirone, that lactone, which are potassium sparing diuretics. If you're if the patient is on pot pot potassium sparing diuretic, that means their body is going to hold on to potassium which is just gonna increase their potassium level even more. So since this drug has the possibility of making the patient hyperkalemic anyway, you wouldn't want them on another drug that's gonna hold on to more potassium. So that's just something that you're gonna to need to remember. I'm probably not saying the word correctly, but it is those potassium sparing diuretics, spironolactone, I don't know how to say it. Um, this drug also prevents cardiac remodeling, which is the enlargement of the left ventricular. That's what enlargement of left ventricular stops remodeling, um, increase of bradykinins that cause the cough. So since this drug prevents cardiac remodeling, it's just kind of something that you need to remember. There are some drugs that will help with cardiac remodeling. This is not, this one prevents that. The next category are the ARBs. These are the drugs that end in Sartan. You can see that there. This one is Valsartan. The brand name is Diavan. 
It is, of course, a for, drug for heart failure, and it's an ARB, which is an angiotensin II receptor blocker. It is a vasodilator, which decreases the systemic vascular resistance, which is the afterload of the heart. So since this is decreasing the vascular resistance, it's going to decrease the workload of the heart. There are a few, uh, uh, there's a adverse effect that we need to know is that this drug does do cardiac remodeling, which can increase the size of the left ventric ventricle. So ACE inhibitors prevent cardiac remodeling. So it's not, I mean, there's a chance that the patient could still have an enlarged left ventricle, but it's not going to be as likely as it would be with an ARB, which does do cardiac remodeling, which will increase the left ventricle size. The next category are those beta blockers. Beta blockers are the drugs that end in OL, OL, or LOL. So we have metroprolol and carvedilol. I can't say that right, but we've talked about these drugs before as well. They are for heart failure, but they're also for antihypertension. They're beta blockers. So there's different ways that this drug can work. It is going to decrease the sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So it's going to decrease heart rate, decrease conduction in the heart, and decrease automaticity. I, can't, I hope I said that right, which is the ability of cardiac cells to stimulate a response. It is cardioprotective. So that's something that you need to know. Beta blockers are cardioprotective, which means that we don't want to push the heart too hard. Decreasing the contractility helps the heart, but it also allows the heart to fill and be more effective. So beta blockers, they're going to decrease the um, workload of the heart, and they're going to help make the heart fill more fully and pump more effectively in the long run. The next category are the aldosterone agonists, which I don't think we talked about. I don't think I had that listed, but it is a drug for heart failure. Um, the method of action is that it blocks aldosterone receptors. Remember, antagonist is going to be like the antagonist of a story. It's like the bad guy of the story. So the antagonist is kind of like working against it. So it is blocking the aldosterone receptors. It's competitive agonist of aldosterone, which causes sodium and water to be excreted, but potassium is spared. So this is that potassium sparing diuretic that we talked about. Here it is with lisinopril. Lisinopril is that drug that you can't, that has the adverse effect of hyperkalemia. This is that potassium sparing diuretic that's going to hold on to potassium in the body. The drug's name is spirolactone and the brand name is aldactone. I'm probably not saying that right, but y'all have heard me say that like a million times, whatever. So it's uh, something that we need to remember is that aldosterone promotes cardiac remodeling, which this is not our friend after a patient has a uh, myocardial infarction. Al aldosterone is not their friend. So spirolactone and ACE inhibitors, not buddies. They're like oil and vinegar. They're not going to get along because this guy over here, the ACE inhibitor is going to hold on to potassium. This guy too not a good thing because then your patient's going to get hyperkalemic. So nursing invocation, not with lisinopril, which is an ACE inhibitor, causes hyperkalemia. The next section is uh, fixed combination drugs. Hopefully I can say this right. Hydrolyzine and isosorbide dinitrate, which is uh, the brand name is Bidil, which is so stupid if you ask me, Bidil, but I mean, bi is going to be two and die. I don't know. I don't know who comes up with these things. But it's a fixed combination because there are two different drugs that are going to be working together. Hydrolyzine is a vasodilator and isosorbide dinitrate is a nitrate. So with those two drugs, you're going to have the adverse effects and um, the nursing implications for nitrates and this particular vasodilator. But the one thing that you need to pay attention to with your patient is postural hypotension. So with postural hypotension, that's the thing where you need to like have your patient sit down, like sit down or lay down before you administer this drug because it can cause like a drop in blood pressure should the patient try to rise or stand up or whatever. So just a thing to remember. Of course, change position slowly. I have that there. And then this is the first drug 
that's been approved for the specific ethnic group of African Americans. It says it reduces mortality rate by 43%, which is pretty good. That's the Bidil. The next category we have are B-type natriuretic peptides. And the drug name is Nesterotide. And the brand name is Natricor. Kind of easy. This drug is for heart failure, but it's specifically for an ICU setting. And it's short-term therapy. So this drug can be... I remember we talked about this. We had several examples in class and our teacher specifically said that this drug, like the example was that the patient has acutely decompensated heart failure who has dyspnea at rest. We'll let you read that. So this drug, Neserotide, is good for patients who have acutely decompensated heart failure with dyspnea at rest. I guess just stick that in your memory and try to keep it there. The drug works because it's a synthetic BNP, B-type nitruretic, natriuretic peptide, which is secreted by the muscle cells of the heart in response to stress. It suppresses the RAS and SNS, and it binds with receptors on the va vascular smooth muscle. So there are going to be several adverse effects, and here they are. Hypotension, of course, dysrhythmias. Uh, we talked about dysrhythmias, or we're going to. Pretty much any drug that can treat a dysrhythmia can also cause a dysrhythmia. So just because it, oh, it's treating blah, blah, blah. Well, it can also cause blah, blah, blah. So since this drug is a potent vasodilator, so that's why hypotension and dysrhythmias are kind of like a big deal. But it can also cause diuresis and naturesis, which is urine, urinary fluid loss and urinary sodium loss because it's increasing the glomerular filtration rate. It's increased in cardiac output. It can cause insomnia, abdominal pain, and a headache. And in heart failure, the BNP can increase as well. Nursing implications is that it's used in the ICU only. It's IV, and it's got a very short half-life of about 18 minutes. So that's all we have for that drug. The next category are the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which is milrione. I hope I said that right. And the brand name is Primacore. Of course, it's for heart failure, but it's a short-term management. This is for patients who are not responding to other drugs like digoxin, diuretics, or vasodilators. It works by inhibiting the enzyme phosphodiesterase, which increases the CAMP levels in the body, which equals a positive ionotropic response. Ionotropic, remember, is force. Remember, Ion, iron is very forceful in this word, I know, kind of reminds me of the word iron. See, I wrote force right there. So this drug results in increased CAMP levels in the body, which is a positive, which, which results in a positive inotropic response, which is vasodilation. And it also decreases serum potassium levels. So since it can decrease serum potassium levels, it can cause hypokalemia. That's one of our things. It's also going to be contraindicated in patients who already have hypokalemia. It can also cause well, the adverse effects, which it can also cause angina, dysrhythmia, hypotension, tremors, and thrombocytopenia. It can cause angina and dysrhythmias because it's increasing the myocardial oxygen demand. It's also safe for diabetics, skin diseases, and ear infections. So just some other little fun facts to know about this drug. Okay, now we're getting to a cardiac glycoside, everybody's favorite or not favorite, digoxin. And the brand name is Lenoxin. Not really original there. This drug is a cardiac glycoside, so it's going to, I'm gonna show this to you too, okay? Increase cardiac contractility, decrease heart rate, and decrease conductivity. So the increased cardiac contractility is positive inotropic. Decreased heart rate is negative chronotropic. And decreased conductivity is negative dromotropic. So the ways that I want you to remember the positive, negative, whatevers. The positive, see, this is what I'm reading right now. The positive inotropic is an increase of force. Remember, inotropy is force, and I like to think of it as an iron. Iron is a very forceful metal, and 
that's just how I remember it. The negative chronotropic, chronotropic is a decreased heart rate. The way that I remembered this, I think I did, uh, how did I remember that? Not chromosomes. I think I thought of it like chronological order and a heart rate kind of has an order to it that I know this is a real big far reach, but we're just going to go with it. Uh, chronologic, which looks kind of like chronotropic, chronologic, chronotropic. I know it's just, it is a reach, but I think of chronological order because like a heart rate has like bump, 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 bump. And it's kind of like there is an order to it. So I think of chronological being heart rate, chronotropic heart rate. There is also an H in chronotropic and it has HR right there, which is heart rate. And then for dromotrophic, that deals with the electrical conduction of the heart. And I think of like a drone, like those little uh, flying machines, like you can go around and take pictures or take video of whatever. I think of a drone because a drone uses electricity, whether it's in the form of a battery or it's charged or whatever. I think of a drone. So think of a drone for electricity and you can think of dromotrophic for electrical conduction. So these are the effects that uh, digoxin, digoxin has. We're of course going to talk about this side in just a second, but this is a little bit more simple. Positive inotropic, which is an increase of force. It's increasing the veloci velocity of myocardial contractions, which decreases, which increases Excuse me, I am going to hold this up so you can read it and pause it. It increases cardiac output, increases urine output, decreases renin release, and decreases sympathetic tone. Negative chronotropic, chrono heart rate, decreases heart rate because there's a prolonging, prolonged refractory period. And that prolonged refractory period is between the SA node and the AV node in the heart. <laughs> And the negative dromotropic is the decreased rate of electrical conduction, which decreases automaticity at the SA node and decreases AV node conduction. So I'm going to hold this here. Hopefully you'll be able to read my handwriting. I'm sorry that it's kind of like, well, I've never really liked my handwriting, but here you go. And here is each one by itself. But the main to remember are for inotropic, that's force. Con chronotropic is like your heart rate. And dromotropic is electrical conductive conductivity, conduction. Uh, just, just with the electrical currents in the heart. Okay, so let's continue talking about digoxin. It's for heart failure, but it does not prolong life. Main thing to know. Uh, it's used to control ventricular response to atrial fibrillation or an atrial flutter. And it's also for a palliation of ex exertional or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, as well as cough and cyanosis. Right there. So this drug works by inhibiting sodium, potassi potassium, and ATP ACE, which promotes calcium accumulation within myocytes, which augments contractile force by interaction of actin and myosin. There are several adverse effects dysrhythmias, bradycardia, tachycardia, colored vision, which is like seeing green, yellow, or purple, GI issues, headache, and confusion. Now, it's causing bradycardia, or it can cause bradycardia because that's what we're trying to do. But, I mean, you're trying to lower the heart rate anyway, so you could lower it way too much. But it can also cause tachycardia because of toxic toxicity. Uh, essentially, your goal here is to slow the heart rate. I'm pretty sure our teacher said that this is the drug that like Agatha Christie tries or Agatha Christie uses in her, her novels to like kill people off. But I might be making that up. I know that there was something that she talked about Agatha Christie and she used it as like a murder weapon because it doesn't come up on like a coroner's report or something or people back in the day were like, oh, they just ate a bad meal and then they died. Oh, their meal was laced with something. I know I digress, whatever. Okay. So all of this stuff can result in increased stroke, which is positive inotropic, increased cardiac circulation, decreased cardiac size or decreased heart size, decreased venous blood pressure, and diuresis, which is increased urination because of the improved blood flow to the kidney. 
There are several nursing implications. It's obtained from the digitalis plant, with the, which is foxglove, which this is the drug that Agatha Christie used. I don't know what book it is, but there's some book out there, maybe several books. I don't know. Um, you have to monitor potassium levels of the drug uh, because or you have to level you have to measure potassium levels of your patient when taking this drug because the potassium level affects how well the drug works. So it you also need to monitor ma ma uh, magnesium, but we're just going to talk about potassium for right now. Potassium level is 3.5 to 5.0. So when potassium levels are slow, binding of the drug increases, which can lead to toxicity. When potassium levels are high, there's the inhibition is reduced, and this can lead to decreased therapeutic response. So see the little stars right there? Potassium levels affect the drug. When there's decreased potassium, it can lead to toxicity. When there's increased potassium, it can lead to ther decreased therapeutic response. Here is the uh, therapeutic window of the drug. It's 0 0.5 to 2. So it's that very narrow window. And it says there's it's heart failure toxic at 1.2. But I think our book says 0 0.5 to 2. But our teacher said she wasn't going to test us on something like that narrow and that finite. Um, it's available oral and IV. The IV, of course, has a more immediate effect. If the patient is taking oral and they miss a dose, they need to call their doctor. Uh, uh, this, this is a drug where when you're administering it, you take the apical pulse before administering it. And the, if the apical pulse is less than 60, hold the dose and call the doctor. There is a loading dose needed as well, and the patient should not eat high fiber foods because fiber binds to digitalis in the digestive system. So back to potassium. Potassium, when it's low, it when it, there are low levels in the body, it can lead to toxicity with this drug, and toxicity can present itself by looking like bradycardia, headache, dizziness, confusion, nausea, visual disturbances, a cardiac block, atrial tachycardia ventricular dys dysrhythmias, and patients who are at risk are patients who are already hypokalemic, whether they're taking a loop diuretic or if they just have potassium loss. So there's your toxicity issue, toxicity stuff. Lots to do with digoxin, but digoxin, while it can be so toxic and has a very narrow therapeutic window, it does have an antidote, which is the Digimind. That's the brand name, and it's Digoxin Immune Fab. I don't know who put the fab there, but it's fabulous. Um, it's for Digoxin toxicity, and it works because it's the antidote for Digoxin. And there are some nursing implications. It's IV, and its onset is 15 to 30 minutes. It works for as long as four to six hours, and it's used in different clinical settings. What patients who have life-threatening cardiac dysrhythmias and patients who have had a life-threatening digoxin overdose. So those are the drugs that we have for heart failure. Remember, there are several drugs that fit in this category as well as in another category. So we're, we were specifically talking about heart failure here. If you're looking for stuff about dysrhythmias or anti-anginals or what have you, go click on another one of those videos and find the section where we're talking about that. But I hope this helps, and maybe one day I'll learn how to say these drugs. Probably not, but maybe one day. I'm hopeful. We'll see what happens.